Macular degeneration is a leading cause of vision loss, with 15% of Americans being at risk or already affected. Scientific evidence proves that by using mesozeaxanthin, lutein, and zeaxanthin together replenishes the macular pigment and promotes healthier vision. This formula comes in only one product, MacuHealth. Welcome to the Open Your Eyes podcast. I'm Dr. Kerry Gelb, the host of the documentary Open Your Eyes. Please visit the film's website at openyoureyes2020.com, featuring interviews with more than 50 optometrists from around the country sharing information on eye care and eye disease. If you like our interviews, press like, subscribe, share, and hit the bell to get notifications of great new interviews. Also, please leave comments. According to WebMD, Blindness is what Americans fear most, but most people who are classified as blind actually have some remaining sight and are classified as having low vision. Low vision means that even with the best corrected regular glasses, contact lenses, medication, or surgery, patients still find it difficult to perform everyday tasks such as reading your mail, shopping, preparing meals, and signing their name. Thanks to research and development in low vision rehabilitation, low vision specialists can enhance the remaining usable vision and improve quality of life. Today's guest, optometric physician, Dr. Stephanie Schmidecki, specializes in low vision rehabilitation and is the chief of low vision service at the Bowden Eye Care and Health Institute, located in San Antonio, Texas. Dr. Schmidecki has helped develop low vision programs in Florida, Puerto Rico, and now Texas. Dr. Schmidecki was a contributing author for continuing education in the National VA Employee Education System. She is a frequent lecturer and has received numerous awards. She trains both optometry and ophthalmology residents and students. Welcome, Dr. Stephanie Schmidecki. Welcome. Thank you so much. Good morning. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited that you're here with us today because low vision, especially when you become an optometry school, is kind of magical and mystical. You know, when they tell us about low vision and we're going to help the blind and we're going to help blind people see, it seems like so confusing. So exactly what is low vision and how can we actually help people that are blind to see? Absolutely. So you brought up a great point. When I was in optometry school, we got our first exposure to low vision in our third year. So optometry school is four years after undergrad. And uh, our course was very math driven and very um, scary, for lack of a better way to put it, a lot of theory, and it just wasn't sexy to us, right? We really enjoyed disease and those kinds of things. So um, when I went out and did my residency and got exposed to the patients and, you know, really seeing how we can change people's lives, um, it, it just, it, it's become a passion and I love it. Low vision basically means that somebody, just like you said perfectly, um, after best correction in glasses or contacts or surgery, um, that they still have problems doing their daily activities of living. Reading mail, watching television, and driving are the big three that we get um, as far as patients wanting goals for. And so what we do is we uh, find out what kind of problems they have on a daily basis because of their vision loss. And then we come up with a rehab plan to help them function in their daily activities to keep them independent. So for example, uh, if glasses can't be corrected to help them see better, then we go into magnification devices, whether that's a handheld device, a telescope, electronic device, um, those kinds of things. And, and that's how we help them function. And many patients, like you said, even after um, they've been diagnosed with low vision, the research shows that 80% of patients that are classified as low vision or legally blind still have functional vision of some sort. And so we're able to rehabilitate almost everybody that comes into our practice. How many people in the US and worldwide are blind or legally blind? And uh, before you give the definition of legally blind, answer that question first about the epidemiology. Sure, so in the entire world, there is over 300, million people that have vision loss. So basically, if you took the United States, everybody in the United States would have vision loss of some level. If you bring it closer to home in America, we have approximately 32 to 39 million Americans that are considered um, 
low vision or legally blind. And what I always found very interesting, and I teach this to my students, is that in the United States, the number of people that are diabetic is approximately about 32 to 39 million Americans. But what do we hear more about, diabetes or vision loss? Diabetes, right? Um, but I was just very surprised that they, they mirror each other, almost the same number. And for every person that's considered legally blind, um, there are three more or three times more people that have some level of low vision. So legal blindness, what is that? That's what you asked. So the social security definition is 2200 or worse in the better seeing eye. So sometimes patients will go to the doctor and they'll be told that they're legally blind in one eye. Well, technically that's not exactly true. You might have that acuity level, but by the definition, you are not legally blind if you have another eye that's better than 2200. Some patients um, have straight ahead vision that's better than 2200, but are still considered legally blind. And that is because there is a definition for side vision. So 20 degrees or less of side vision will also classify you as legally blind. So some patients, for example, retinitis pigmentosa, that's a congenital condition. Most of those patients have very good central vision until the very end of their disease, but their side vision starts to cave in. So they can be considered legally blind and obtain social security benefits, even though they might be 2020 straight ahead. So if you say they have poor side vision or 20 degree vision, demonstrate what that means. Absolutely. So approximately 20 degrees of side vision is about your shoulder width. So once you start to cave in past that level, most patients will start to have significant visual uh, function loss and, and problems. And um, most people, if they're beyond 20 degrees, even though most people have at least 160 to 180, which is going to be almost, um, you know, parallel to your your shoulders out into the periphery, but 20 is going to be about shoulder width. And once you start to get into this range, this is when patients start to have significant function um, disability and we need to rehabilitate. And now explain that as, as opposed to, or as the same as tunnel vision. Great. So a tunnel vision is very similar. So if you are looking, let's say through a toilet paper roll, that could be an example of tunnel vision. It just means that when you're looking straight ahead, um, everything off to the side is um, unable to be seen. So very similar with somebody that's got side vision loss that's starting to cave in, uh, it will come into this tunnel vision per se that you're describing. Right, so now some people could see poorly like 2400, the best they could see, and other people could have tunnel vision and the 2400 person actually does better than the tunnel vision. Why is that the case? That's a great question. So research shows that even patients that are 2400 and just to kind of give the public an idea, if when you go to the eye doctor and you see the big E on the eye chart, that those are the acuities and, and vision levels that we're talking about 2200, 2400. So in addition to having straight ahead vision, we also use our side vision. And so somebody that's 2400 needs a, a letter that's 400 feet tall at 20 feet in order to be able to see. They still have a lot of their side vision, which gives a lot of visual cues. So they're still able to walk around and see things. And um, even research shows that driving, you really don't need the 2020 and 2040 acuity that they require. Um, even 2200 and 2400 can see the big objects, but it's not safe. So that's a whole nother topic. Well, we don't want to bore people with a lot of uh, uh, optics, but I do have to ask you this question. Explain what 2040 means, 2100 means, what the top number means and what the bottom number means for the people out there that are that are watching. And, you know, to them, it's very magical and mystical. They come into our offices and they want to know what does that mean? What's on my 20 watt? And they're very competitive about it, especially if you get a, a competitive athlete. So if you oh, could explain yeah. and clear that up. Absolutely. And your engineers and architects, they want to see even smaller. Your pilots, <laughs> they want to be seeing 2010. So basically what it means uh, at 20 feet, so that's your top number, that's your test distance. At 20 feet, you're able to see, for example, if you're 2020, you can see a 20 foot letter at 20 feet away, basically. So if you're 2400, that means that your letter would need to be 400 feet tall in order for you to be able to see it. So you wouldn't be able to see that 20 foot tall letter, it would need to be 400 feet tall. 
for you to see it. Excellent. Thank you for that. Okay, let's talk about some of the common causes of low vision. And, you know, people are, are amazed and, and, and very interested in people that are born blind. What are some of the reasons people actually are born blind? Sure. So uh, when we see low vision patients, they basically come into two categories, like you're just describing. So we have congenital conditions, meaning the patient was born with a problem that made them have vision loss, or the acquired conditions, which means they had normal vision, quote unquote, throughout most of their life. And then at some point, something happened, whether it was a stroke, a brain injury, or an eye disease that made them start to lose vision. So patients that are born with eye diseases, some of those can include retinitis pigmentosa. That's a very common eye condition uh, that patients are born with and start to have vision loss. And that is one that we spoke about just a few minutes ago that not only does the side vision start to get compromised, but that straight ahead detail vision starts to get compromised. And those patients, even though they're 20-20 during the day, as soon as light starts to go down, they start to lose all of their vision. So they're not able to see at night. Another condition is... Um, uh, albinism. So patients in those cases, their straight ahead vision is a little compromised and they have sensitivity to light, but their side vision is fine. Um, aniridia is another condition where a patient may not be born with the colored part of their eye, what we call the iris. And so they have a lot of light that comes into the eye, which makes them very sensitive to light and they're not able to see very well either. And there's very simple things that we can do to fix those. So Ton, tons of different conditions. How about kids that are premature? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so retinopathy of prematurity is another common condition. Mm -hmm. And why do those people become blind or can so become blind? Yeah. So with those patients, um, the eye isn't getting the oxygen that it needs. And what we learn is that the eye is basically an extension of the brain. And so when those children are born premature, they don't have the eye fully developed. And even once we're born, our eye is the last organ that continues to grow and develop, um, you know, after birth. So a patient with ROP or retinopathy or prematurity has difficulty, um, basically the retina has uh, the tissue in the back of the eye that's kind of like our film of a camera, um, isn't able to be fully developed and can get retinal detachments, which means that tissue separates from the eye and they have a lot of functional problems because of that. The great thing now is that our NICU units really do help these patients and we don't have the extreme conditions of ROP like we did when we, um, maybe had the, the challenges 20, 30 years ago. So we're making really good advances in that area. Absolutely. So when you talked about retinitis pigmentosa before, is that a hereditary condition or more of an acquired condition? Great question. So retinitis pigmentosa is a genetic uh, condition. So it is passed down from the family. And we actually do genetic testing in our practice. And we're finding now um, genetics is really starting to evolve because we're fortunate now to have programs that are sponsoring these very expensive tests. Normally, they could be between two or $3,000 for a family to get this genetic testing. We have a grant sponsorship that is getting this funded for our patients um, through a foundation, and we're identifying now many more categories of retinitis pigmentosa. You know, when I was in school, we learned there may be 10 or 15 kinds. Now there's maybe over 30 or more um, because we're finding all these different um, changes in the proteins of our genetic um, DNA, basically, and finding uh, what kind of things are causing these problems. So it's definitely something that you're born with. It can either be passed down from um, your um, X-linked, as we say, which means it would come from, um, you know, the, the men would constantly have that, that issue. And then we also have what we call autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive. And kind of what we learned in school is that autosomal dominant would mean that um, it would be passed down through every generation, whereas a recessive gene may not be expressed um, in the families. At, you know, might skip a generation per se. Um, but even now with the genetics Ed, that we're getting tested, we're finding that even some of these things, the basic genetics that we learned in school are being challenged and changed as well. So even an X-linked um, uh, patient, it doesn't have to just be uh, male. It can also be females that can get some sort of it. That The challenge is knowing how much penetrance 
basically, or how much, what that means is how much um, expression you're going to have of that problem when that gene uh, has the issue that it has. So some patients may have the same gene, um, but it may express differently, meaning that one person may have a more severe condition than someone else. And so it, it's really fascinating the things that we're finding. How far do you think we are with gene therapy that are going to be able to prevent people from getting, we know that there's genetics, the, the, the family that we may be able to uh, prevent people from going blind from these type of genetic diseases. Yeah, you know, you brings up something very fascinating and, and very, um, I guess, hot topic right now. So of all the gene therapies, the first one right now is in the eye space. And so that is a product called Luxterna. And that is a drug that um, is focusing on these patients with a gene called RPE65. And um, they're doing these injections. It's a viral vector. Um, so what that means is that the genetic material is put into a virus that is injected into the eye. And then that gene will go into the tissue and start to replicate and hopefully make the bad gene um, better. And um, the it's still kind of new, which I think is very exciting. Um, and from that, there's a lot of other clinical trials that are happening right now. I believe there might be 40 in the eye space. And ONIM, O-N-I-M, is a website that you can go to, anybody can go to, and it has the whole database of any kind of clinical trial that you might be interested in. And it tells you the requirements, where the testing's being done, who the um, PI or principal investigator is, so you can reach out to them and, and figure out if you might be a candidate. And a lot of them do require you to get genetic testing so they can figure out specifically what gene you have uh, that's causing your problems. So it's very exciting. Well, one more question about retinitis pigmentosa. Uh, there's many different variations as we know. At what age and what's the, I guess, the ranges of where people actually start losing vision? From what age does it start where they start losing vision to what age could, does it go to? And do some people never lose the vision that have it? Yep. So it runs the full gamut. Um, some patients within the first couple years of life start to have vision loss, while others may be in their 20s or 30s before they start to no notice changes. And from my um, clinical experience, what I found are the ones that are maybe more slowly progressing, meaning that the side vision is the one that starts to cave in a little slower than others. Those patients really don't realize that they're having vision loss because it's happening so slowly that they're learning to adapt as it's happening until again, it starts to get into that 20 degree range. And that's when they start to say, hey, I don't see as well as I used to. Um, or of course the problems with the night vision and, and that kind of thing. But RP, like we said, has um, so many different variants of it that some of those patients go totally blind, meaning they can't see in daytime, nighttime, or their side vision. And other patients with retinitis pigmentosa do retain some level of vision. So it really just depends on which uh, gene they have and, and the prognosis. And like we said, the penetrance, you know, the genetic factors, environmental factors, all those things kind of play a role. So um, we're finding a lot of variability in that. And some of the acquired causes of vision loss or illegal blindness. Yes. So the big four is what we call them. So cataracts, of course, everybody over 40, you get initiated into the cataract club. We all get it. Um, and from what I've read is that most of our damage from cataracts happens by the time we're seven to 10 years old, because it's just sun exposure. And just like on your skin, as you grow up, you start to get these moles and changes. Um, same thing with the eyes, that UV light is starting to um, show its effects. And it usually starts in the age of 40. So if you're starting to wear bifocals because your arms aren't long enough, you, uh, you actually have a cataract. Um, and you're starting to experience that and that's totally normal. But some patients for whatever reason, either don't get surgery or don't have the accessibility to get surgery. And so the cloudiness of that lens starts to impair function. And when that happens, we can do different um, filters of colors to help them function or magnification. And then the second one is macular degeneration. And this one is very uh, well known as well. 
Um, this one is going to be one that affects that detailed vision, that straight ahead vision. And one thing that I always want to tell my patients is that if you just have macular degeneration, you are never going to go totally blind. So that is one of the biggest fears I think I see when I'm having those patients in my chair is, oh, I've got macular degeneration, I'm going blind. Well, that's not entirely true. So most patients with macular degeneration, especially with the injections of VEGF and all the other um, treatments that we have available to us now, roughly about that 2200, maybe 2400 is where you're going to stop from a functional vision standpoint. And when you have vision level of that, we're able to rehabilitate that. Many of those patients, we can get back to 2020. Um, again, it just depends on your specific condition. Um, if it's a wet macular degeneration or a dry, how long you've had it, how big the scar tissue is in the back of the eye. And once we put all those things together, we are definitely able to rehabilitate those patients. But that's one of the biggest fears of I find with my patients with macular degeneration. Then the third one is glaucoma. And glaucoma is normally a condition, it can be congenital, meaning the, the child's born with the condition. That one's more aggressive and a lot of those patients do lose significant vision. Um, and then we have the acquired form that's gonna happen maybe later in life in the 50s and that kind of thing. And that is a condition that is a, a silent uh, killer of eye, of eye vision. Uh, vision loss, in my opinion, because you don't know what's happening. Um, the eye pressure is going up in the eye, so you won't feel it unless it's very extreme in pressure. And by the time many of those patients get to our practice, we find that they've lost a lot of that side vision. And that's what happens with glaucoma is the side vision starts to get compromised. And unfortunately with glaucoma, because it is the silent killer of vision, once that tissue is gone, it, it's gone, we can't get it back. So the sooner we get a patient identified with glaucoma uh, and get them on treatment, as you know, with eye drops or surgery, then we can get into the function and try to help them. A lot of the patients with glaucoma we're finding too is even though they're 2020 on the eye chart, they're gonna tell the doctor that I don't see as well as I used to. And sometimes we don't understand because 2020 is the same, whether six months ago, a year from now, it's still 2020. But what I have found is what those patients are trying to tell us is that their functional vision isn't 2020. So, you know, on our uh, acuity charts, when we're in clinic, we check on very high contrast acuity charts. So very bold letters on a very white background, but our world isn't high contrast. It's more moderate contrast, low contrast, rainy days, overcast days, dim conditions, going from indoors to outdoors. And so those patients might see 2020 on that high contrast chart, but in everyday world, they may be down to 2040, 2060, 2100. And how we determine that is we use a chart called a contrast sensitivity chart. So that shows us a very bold, high contrast acuity letter. And then it goes down to um, different gradations into dimmer and dimmer and dimmer letters. And then we can identify what that patient is seeing based on um, the, the testing that we do there. And most of those patients, we find that the complaint is what they're trying to tell us is that they have contrast loss. They don't have, you know, straight ahead, high contrast acuity loss. And then the final one is diabetic uh, retinopathy from diabetic eye disease. And like I mentioned earlier, there's the same number of people that have diabetic uh, retinopathy that have low vision. So I just think those numbers are very powerful that as many people that have diabetes, there's just as many people that have low vision. But like you've mentioned, uh, blindness is feared more than death. And literature shows us that over and over. And we don't want to talk about things that scare us. So diabetes, I don't think is as scary per se as, um, of course, the... Um, you know, vision loss. And so with diabetes, as you know, um, most patients, if they've had diabetes for five or 10 years, they have problems in the back of the eye. And what I'm finding is, is that even patients very early in that disease, because as you know, when a patient's diagnosed with diabetes, they've probably already had that condition for a few years. And so in the back of the eye, that tissue isn't functioning at the high level that it used to. So um, things are becoming more leaky and I almost call it like a boggy marsh, meaning that um, you know the blood vessels are starting to leak, fluids and nutrients are starting to um, escape from those tissues and they're not getting the food and oxygen 
uh, at the performance level that they used to. And so when that happens, when light comes into the eye, those tissues aren't functioning at their optimum level. So they've got more glare and scatter and just things aren't functioning like they should. And when that happens, again, those Patients are 20-20 on the acuity chart, but they're telling us they don't see as well as they used to. So they'll be common, those frequent flyers that come into the practice where they want their glasses changed four or five times because they think there's something wrong. And there is something wrong. It's a contrast issue, but we don't always look at that first from a um, pr uh you know, private practice optometrist because we're not looking at the rehab. So as long as they're 2020, we think that everything is okay. But in fact, there's a functional loss and they actually need rehabilitation. So one thing I do when I'm seeing primary care or what we call everyday um, overall health optometry patients and I'm not doing my rehab, as soon as I diagnose a patient with an eye disease, I'm going to tell them, let's say macular degeneration. You know, Mrs. Jones, you have macular degeneration. Um, this is going to affect your detailed straight ahead vision. When you start to have problems reading your mail, watching TV, seeing, um, you know, the, the things that you normally like to do, that means it's time to get some help with a rehab low vision optometrist or come back to me and I can help you with some basic filters and stronger glasses. And then if that gets to a level where that's no longer helpful for you, then we can go to the next stage. But just always know that there's going to be things to help you. And when you start to have these problems, you need to let me know. And a lot of times with macular degeneration too, um, I've had a few of these cases where, as you know, when they start to have a lot of that loss, our brain fills in for what's missing. And so they get what we call Charles Bonnet effect, which means that if I was looking at my friend, they may have a dragon on their face. Or if I'm looking at, you know, a menu at a restaurant, I might see, um, a toothbrush there. And it's because the brain is filling in for that missing um, information that it's not getting visually. And normally the image that they see doesn't make sense. And they might not want to tell anybody because they think they're going crazy. Um, and the other big thing I see, especially with macular degeneration patients too, is that family members don't understand that sometimes they can see something and then sometimes they can't see anything, you know, five minutes later. And they're like, what do you mean you can't see that? Are you, you know, maybe exaggerating or faking or, or they just don't understand. And um, so we take a lot of time to educate patients that way and even use vision simulators. And there's some apps on um, your phones, your smartphones that can simulate these kind of things. But I know that's a long way around, but those are the four big conditions for uh, vision loss. So by the time someone sees somebody like you for re vision rehab, a lot of these conditions are preventable. And so if you could put a shout out to the people watching this, that it's better to prevent them from coming to see you uh, by what can they do to, to, for that to happen rather than having to be in, their low, in the low vision clinic. Absolutely. So as you know, macular degeneration, diabetic eye disease, those things can be prevented with good nutrition. And like your, um, your movie, Open Your Eyes, explains that. Um, and I encourage anybody that hasn't watched that to please, you know, take a look at that and see that, you know, basic nutrition and taking care of our eyes um, and taking care of our, our health basically can really prevent a lot of these things. And, you know, my Mac, uh, my diabetic patients, um, I actually have a couple cases where they've come to me, they've had an amputation because what happens with diabetes is what we see in the eye is happening all over in the body. So if I start to see bleeding in the back of the eye or um, tissue that's starting to get pulled off because of the fibrosis that happens from the healing mechanism, because the back of the eye can't uh, scar, well, basically can't scab over. I'm telling them, if I'm seeing bleeding in the back of your eye, this is happening in your heart, your lungs, your kidneys. But research shows that even if you reduce your body mass index by 10%, you can reverse diabetes. And I just think that's powerful. And I think a lot of people don't understand that. And I think the other thing that they may not understand is it's not just... Um, losing weight. It's the kind of foods that you eat, right? So for many years, we've been told low fat, um, you know, and again, your, your video uh, explains it well, but it's actually the sugar that's causing the problem. And it doesn't mean a Snickers is the only thing that's sugar, right? So a tortilla turns into sugar, 
pasta turns into sugar. And when all these things happen in the body, it creates that insulin resistance because if every meal is something that turns into sugar, then the body just ignores it. And then it turns into pre-diabetes and diabetes. But I think working with a nutritionist, which is one of the things we did uh, in my practice, I had a Victor's practice, which is the Vision Impairment Center to optimize remaining sight at the VA in Lake City, Florida. And that team of people was really the best model, I thought, um, to help people with vision loss, even early eye disease. So we had a nutritionist that talked to them about food and how to take care of themselves, a social worker to handle any kind of problems that they might be having, getting into services that might be beneficial for them, a rehab psychologist, which is a psychologist that specializes in rehabilitation and loss. So um, not just having a, a general psychologist, but one that specifies in loss because vision loss is a loss and you have grief with that. And sometimes the the person that has the vision loss might have been the main provider in the family, and now they're not able to be, and there's role reversals. There's just a lot of things that go into that. So having the family involved in that rehab, I think, is important as well. Um, but those were the main people um, on our team. And then, of course, ophthalmology and optometry. Um, but as soon as the patient is diagnosed with the eye condition, I encourage them to be aware of the problems that they might start to have and to let their doctor know those things so that either the optometrist or ophthalmologist can take care of it right away or refer them early to um, someone that does low vision because the research is showing that it takes over 10 years for somebody to have low vision before they're referred to anybody. And every day in my chair, I have a patient crying, telling me how come no one didn't tell me about this sooner? Why have I been suffering for so many years not being able to function? And that, that's hard to hear. And also about for a preventive measure, just even frequent exams, you get the diabetic who hasn't had their eyes examined for 10, 15 years. Now, primary care is really good about making sure their patients are getting yearly eye exams, but patients with glaucoma that haven't seen a doctor until they were 45 years old or 55 years old. It's just the frequency. And sometimes with people now with uh, people getting the wrong impression that they could get their eyes examined on a cell phone and maybe bypassing, you know, going and getting a medical eye exam. If you could comment on that. No, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, visual acuity or what you see is just one teeny, 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 tiny little space in the back of the eye, what we call the fovea. And that's the tissue that you use when you look straight ahead. But the entire rest of the eye is all your side vision, your periphery, your paraphobia, all the kind of stuff that we talk about. Um, you can't see that by just testing your vision straight ahead. Um, so none of us like to be dilated, let's be real. In optometry school, we had to practice on each other and I've been dilated more times as you have too. Um, we don't enjoy that, but there's so many things that can be going on in the back of the eye. Um, the diabetes, the high blood pressure, cancers, glaucoma. I mean, the the it's it's just endless in the amount of eye disease that we can see it's one of the few organs in the body that we don't have to cut open to see the inside to see what's going on we can see your blood vessels we can see your nerves which send information to the brain those are things that you can't see anywhere else and if we identify that there's changes in those tissues that means it's happening all over in the body and it's so crucial to get those those checked at least once a year and this is really important coming from somebody like you, who's a vision rehab specialist, who sees patients when the wheels are already off the bus. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, yeah. and all, all disease is a spectrum. So if we could kind of catch them early and people get into the doctor and get their medical eye care early, we could prevent a lot of these patients from going blind. Absolutely. Yeah. A lot of things. I, I do have a question I want to ask you about neurodegenerative disease, people that are getting Alzheimer's. What do they experience in their vision? And sometimes they, their vision seems good. They have almost 20-20 vision, but they feel they don't see good. 
You know, that's an interesting question. We don't really get that many referrals of Alzheimer's patients in our practice. Um, I think it might be something that's up and coming because we're seeing that the number of Alzheimer's patients is increasing. And I think we're finding that a lot of the causes of it is food related. Um, so hopefully we can, you know, change that or, or stop that so that we don't have as many patients with those problems. But the, the eye, like we said, is an extension of the brain um, and it's a processing system. So so if there's processing problems happening in the brain, even with brain injuries, um, we see it. Somebody that's had um, like from a, uh, OIF or OEF operation, Endurium Freedom operation, Iraqi Freedom, those vets coming back had these blast injuries, which would have um, the contusions of the brain. So their brain floats in fluid just like everybody else's and when the blast would happen the brain would be um, sloughed back and forth between the front frontal lobe and you know the occipital lobe of the brain just hitting the um, skull and when that happens it shakes up that visual system and it creates what i call visual noise which means it's very hard for them to attend to anything that has a lot of visual uh, confusion they like a lot of peace and quiet and calm they don't like to see a lot of activity in their background. So like your background's much more calming than mine is because I have a lot of visual noise. There's a lot of stuff to attend to. And I think that might be something that's happening with Alzheimer's patients as well, that um, there's processing issues happening in the brain and it can only attend to so many things. And so, um, you know, like with the brain injury patients, we find that um, lighting is a problem. So we give them some filters to calm that visual system down. And we find like a bluish tint seems to help. And one note on that, just because a filter looks blue or yellow doesn't mean that it has the per, uh, specific wavelength that is going to calm that system down. So those need to be prescribed. You can't just get those over the counter just because it walks like a duck and looks like a duck. It's not necessarily a duck, kind of like the over the counter reading glasses. You know, if you're not getting to the eye doctor and you're picking up those reading glasses, there's so much more than just what's going on visually with that detail vision. You really need to get that checked out. Um, and those glasses, um, they're cheap, which is great, especially if you've gone to a doctor and you maybe just need a couple extra because you lose them often, but to use them as a crutch um, to not go to the doctor is really hurting yourself more than helping you. Um, those glasses don't have um, what we call the optical centers designed for you, which means that they can induce prism, which can cause visual uh, discomfort and you can get tired and fatigued and all kinds of other issues. Um, so and they also might be hiding the problems that are happening in the back of the eye, um, bleeding and, and that kind of thing. You just really need to get it checked out. Vision Edge gives you less eye strain and reduced damage caused by blue light. We like to call Vision Edge sunscreen for the eye. It all starts with your highest level of visual performance, only achievable through scientifically proven Vision Edge. Thank you for tuning in to the Open Your Eyes podcast. If you like the video you're watching, please hit the like button. Also, hit subscribe for weekly new episodes of the podcast, along with pod winks and bonus content. All right, let's get back to the show. So let's talk about categories of vision loss of people that may need low vision. We talked about loss of peripheral vision. Uh, let's talk about blurred vision okay. and un not being able to correct blurred vision. Uh, what kind of blurred vision is it? And and uh, what are the people experiencing? Sure. So depending on what's happening in the eye will kind of depend what the patient's seeing. So what you're describing, the blurry vision. Um, some patients, ones that are born with eye disease that puts them immediately at 2100 and they don't get any better, they wouldn't understand what blurry is as you and I would because they don't know anything different. So for conditions that are more acquired from diabetes or um, a central condition that's causing vision loss, um, those are the ones that are probably going to be considered this blurriness. And the blurriness can depend. So if it's caused by a cataract, it may be a cloudiness, like um, maybe your bathroom um, mirror that gets, you know, frosted over when things are uh, really steamy, or even your shower door that starts to get um, opacified, maybe from calcium deposits, that kind of thing. If you have hard, wa hard water, those are the kind of things that'll start to happen. And 
things might look blurry or distorted to some level. If it's a retinal issue, um, maybe from macular degeneration or a stroke to the eye, um, a central retinal vein occlusion, a branch retinal vein occlusion, um, those kinds of things, that is going to look different. And the blurriness can be caused from swelling in the back of the eye. So we have 10 layers of tissue in that retina. And if one of those layers is starting to experience some fluid or separation of those tissues, those photoreceptors are going to get um, confused information and kind of that boggy, con uh, boggy tissue that I described where the light's going to come in, it's not being processed as efficiently as it used to. And so it's going to bounce around and, and not get to the optic nerve and into the brain as effectively as it did. And so because of that, they're not going to be able to see as clearly because they're going to have that internal glare. So the fluid can cause the issue and the glare can cause an issue, which combines to that blurriness that you're describing. And you talked about contrast and you brought up glare. How can we help people that have really poor contrast or really bad glare problems? Great question. So very simply, if somebody has problems with contrast issues um, or glare that you're describing, um, some of the simple things is doing a colored lens or what we call a filter. Um, so I have an example here. Um, and again, this is you know, prescribed by an optometrist or ophthalmologist, but this is just a yellow filter. And you can either have one that slips behind your glasses, or you can have a pair of glasses designed with this specific wavelength filter that will help um, enhance that contrast. Yellow, I find, is very effective for my macular patients, any kind of macular issues that they have. Um, there's other colors like we talked about a little while ago. The blue tints also make a difference for your brain injury patients. But something else to note is it's not only the color, but it's um, the amount of light or what we call TLT, which is fancy for total light transmittance. That's how much light that the filter is going to allow through the lens. So just because it's yellow, if it's too dark of a yellow, it doesn't let enough light through it. You're not going to function as well as one that might be lighter. How do we know which one will work? Again, you have to be evaluated by your specialist and we have the full range of the different tints to test you. The other thing to consider is when are you having these problems? So some patients might be having issues when they're reading um, in their easy chair. Another patient might be having problems when they're sitting as a passenger in the car. So you always wanna be tested in the environment that you're having your functional impairment and then we can prescribe something that's going to be best for you. One last thing to note for this is it's kind of like um, a carpenter. You can't use a hammer to um, screw in a, a screw, right? So you're gonna need different tools for different tasks. And so I always tease my men, it's time to get a man bag. Mm -hmm. Ladies, it's time to get a purse. And you may have different uh, tools that you're gonna need in your arsenal to help you function in these different activities of daily living. I'm so excited to talk to you about how to help low vision patients. We're going to get to that in a minute because they're like becoming the new gamers based on low vision. So the low vision and the legally blind patients are really our new gamers. But before that, how about night people with poor night vision? How can we help them? You know, the simplest thing that you can do if you have problems at night, and a lot of us have problems with uh, vision at night. You know, a 60 year old eye needs a lot more light than a 20 year old eye does. It's just the way it is. So a lot of my patients, I just recommend having those little flashlights that you can carry on your keychain or in your purse or, you know, in your pocket. And it's just an LED light. It can be of any, um, you know, variant that you want, one that's comfortable for you and just carry it with you and uh, use it when you need it. That's probably the easiest thing that you could have. You know, a lot of these patients want to still be able to drive and, you know, depending on the state, the, the requirements are a little bit different, but typically what are the requirements and can we get some of these people to be able to drive a car? Absolutely. So, you know, you bring up such an interesting point. We just talked about this in my low vision course with my students and every state has such a different level of acuity that's needed or, or vision that's needed to be able to drive. And then in addition to that, not only the straight ahead vision, but a lot of states 
require side vision. In Texas, we don't. We make a recommendation for side vision, but it's not a requirement. So technically, I could have a patient that has very reduced side vision, and they could go down to the DMV and do a test, and they may pass because straight ahead they see the requirement. Um, so in Texas, it's approximately 2050. They can function um, without much restriction. Once it hits 2070 to 2080, then they need to um, be considered for other devices. In Texas and some other states, you can use what we call a bioptic, which means it's a telescope that's mounted in glasses that sits above the line of sight. And what it's used for is kind of like a side view mirror on the car. It's to identify things that are coming ahead that you need to have detail for. So if you need to see a street sign or you need to be able to see what an exit number is gonna be. Um, there's certain levels where that's cut off visually. So about 2200 is kind of where we stop. But if you have vision of 2200 or better, and you live in the state of Texas, you could be evaluated for this special, excuse me, this special telescope and you may be able to drive. I always say that with a grain of salt because in addition to that, you need to be able to be very cognitive and functional. Um, so you would have a behind the wheel evaluation and you would also be referred to an occupational therapist that's certified in driving rehabilitation and your low vision optometrists or ophthalmologists would have those resources of where to find that um, to get that testing done. But it wouldn't just be getting the device and then going and starting to drive. But many patients are still able to do that. Um, but again, not every state require, uh, allows it. So that would be something you'd want to talk with your doctor about. And you mentioned before, that there's a lot of people to help the, uh, on the team, really. Occupational therapists, psychologists, you know, people that go blind, you know, get very depressed. How do we get them from depression to acceptance? Yes, and that is a tough question, right? So like we mentioned before, vision loss is loss, right? And so there's a grieving process and with grief, there's different stages. Um, my best advice is the sooner that a patient is identified with an eye disease, whatever that eye disease is, they should get into rehabilitation the same year or the same time. You shouldn't wait for vision to get to a certain acuity level before you refer the patient. Because we find if patients are um, integrated into rehab sooner, they're more adaptive and they're more receptive to the different devices that are available to them. And they've learned over the years how to use these devices. It's not like they wait 10 or 15 years, their vision's really compromised. They get thrown into rehab and shown devices and evaluated with them. And they have to have such a huge learning learning curve. I always think of it like knee surgery. So if you have knee surgery, what does the surgeon do? He sends you to rehab, right? He sends you to physical therapy. You get treatment. He doesn't say, oh, wait for 10 years. And then if your knee's still giving you some problems, go ahead and go to a physical therapist. So it kind of needs to be that team approach right from the beginning. Obviously, the most important thing is to stop or manage the disease. But the second arm of that is to go ahead and refer to vision rehab at the same time. The uh, American Academy of Ophthalmology, um, Dr. Fontenot had put out a video a few years ago, and he basically said that low vision services is now the standard of care for uh, vision. And he said that 2040 or worse would be the time to refer. I like to go even a step further because a 2020 patient that has issues with contrast may not be able to do the jobs that they're doing. So, um, you know, if somebody's a truck driver and they have vision loss, um, even of, you know, 20, 100 per se, um, they wouldn't be able to do their job anymore. They would need to get rehab right away versus a waitress that might have 2100 vision level. They may still be able to wait tables and, and function. So again, the sooner that patients are referred in, the better the um, uh, success with depression not having that hold. Now let's talk about the low vision exam and how it differs from a regular eye exam. And let's start with something that's very important called eccentric viewing and something that I guess you have to teach patients how to do. Uh, what is it? How hard is it to teach patients how to do eccentric viewing? 
Yeah, so if a patient has a problem that affects their straight ahead detail vision, we teach them how to use the part of the eye that hasn't been damaged from that eye condition. And so we call that eccentrically viewing. So for example, if I had the condition that if I was looking straight ahead, it was hard for me to see you, I would usually tell the patient to try to look above what they're trying to look at. So I would just tell them, go ahead and look up at my hand and see if my face comes into better view. Um, and if it does, even if my hand disappears, that means that you're moving the bad tissue out of the way so that you can use the tissue surrounding that bad spot, um, a, what we call eccentrically viewing, to see the detail that you want to be able to see. It may not be as crystal clear as if it was looking straight ahead before you had the problem, but this will help you move that around. And research shows that most patients, if they look um, to the 12 or one o'clock spot, if they're looking at something, that is the easiest way for them to rehabilitate with eccentric viewing. But again, each patient's different. We go through a series of tests um, to see what part of the eye would be the best to rehabilitate. And we also have different instruments that can test that as well. And then we give them homework basically to help them learn how to localize, to find something, um, and then to scan and, and track things. So. If you aren't sure if eccentric viewing would work for you, the, the big thing that I always ask my patients are, you know, when you look at something and you try to write something down, instead of writing on the line, you start to write down at a diagonal or you start to go above the line that you're writing. That would be an indication that you found a part of the eye that you can use to see things with that eccentric viewing position, but you don't have it stabilized to the point that you're able to scan with it because you start to lose it as you start to write above or below the line. And uh, eccentric viewing can help with that with as little as five to 10 minutes, three times a day. We see great success. Um, what other tests do, does a low vision, does a low vision exam uh, encompass that may be a little different than a regular eye exam? Yes. So a low vision exam is definitely going to be uh, different than your everyday um, eye health exam. And so one of the big questions all my patients have are, are you going to dilate me? And the answer is no, I'm not going to dilate you. That is what your, your eye specialist that's managing your disease is going to be doing. I'm going to be helping you figure out what kind of problems on a daily basis you have because of your vision, and then figure out a rehab plan that's going to help you to be able to function. So that's the first question I ask them is what what kind of things do you have a problem on a daily basis with because of your vision loss? I also ask them how long it's been since they've been able to do those things that they like to do. And it's very interesting to hear those answers. And then the third question I always ask them is, um, if you could describe to me how you see the world, can you share that with me? Is your world uh, blurry, dim, distorted, fuzzy, hazy, missing? better in good light or bad light. And uh, they kind of describe that, that world to me. And then I finish with saying, you know, I can't give you back what you've lost, but if I can give you a little bit here and a little bit there that adds up to more than what you have when you walked in this door, then we've been successful. And 80% of patients that come through the practice will have success at some level. As long as you have an open heart and an open mind, there's all kinds of things that we can do to help you function. And then from there, we check the vision and we use different charts. So instead of what you may have been told is your finger counting a couple feet or a couple inches, we have specialized charts that will give you a vision acuity level. So instead of counting fingers at two feet, you might actually be, you know, two, three hundred. That may not mean anything to you, but from a rehab specialist, I can convert that into a mathematic number and then using optics and that kind of thing, I can figure out what kind of power magnification would help you function better as opposed to, you know, finger counts at a couple feet. And then from there, we go into the contrast test. That's a big thing that we look at. And after that, then we do a refraction. And instead of using the cute little Mickey ears or the four opter uh, that we use in our regular practice, we do it in free space with a pair of glasses and loose lenses that we'll place in front of your eye. And the reason why we do that is that a couple of reasons. One, it's going to give you a more um, natural visual state. So you're gonna have all the lighting because when I put you behind the four opter, I'm cutting your light, I'm cutting your side vision, um, and I'm not giving you the ability to look in your natural space. So if you're centrically viewing, maybe at one o'clock, it's very hard for you to do that when you're behind the four opter. 
So with these glasses or a trial frame refraction, as we call it, um, the trial frames will help you get into that natural state. And then I can put different tints in those um, glasses. I can put sample telescopes in those glasses, all kinds of different things that I can do to see how you function in those different environments. And then once I do that, I'm able to determine what your functional level is because of contrast. I test your side vision uh, using what we call an arc perimeter, which is basically a black um, plastic half pan that we test the vision in free space as opposed to sitting them behind an instrument like we normally do for our glaucoma and other things, what we call a Humphrey visual field machine. We can use those as well, but we like to do everything in a natural state to see how patients are actually functioning. And then once I do that, and I've done that good refraction to see if glasses are going to help you or even tweak things a little bit, then I go into magnification and I look at different devices, whether your goal is reading or distance, we can do hand and stand magnifiers, telescopes, filters, all those kinds of things. And that's pretty much it. We write a rehab plan and we bring you back until you're, um, you know, efficient in doing your daily activities. Oh, well, that's great. I appreciate that. Now, for the for the really interesting part, to, when we talk about what we could do to help these low vision patients in a little bit more detail, and I know that you have some things that you could demonstrate for us. First, let's talk about the old way low vision was, and low vision has changed a lot, but the old way were just the old telescopes and the old magnifiers. Talk about that and and then let's bring it up to low vision of today. Absolutely. So back when I was in school and when you were in school, these devices were not attractive at all. They were very big and archaic and um, just uh, kind of like what we used to call the military glasses in the VA, those birth control glasses, same kind of thing. They just weren't attractive. Um, now things got are a little bit better. Um, they still have a ways to go. I always tell my students, if you want to have a niche in, in optometry or ophthalmology, go ahead and create some attractive um, low vision devices. I, I think you'll have a whole new business. Um, I think we talked about it earlier. Uh, one of my colleagues has created telescopes and and uh, he's made them different color choices. And he actually used the colors of the iPhone. Uh, so a lot of the kids like those different colors. Um, but traditionally, and even now, most of the devices are either white or black. Um, some of them may have a little bit of blue or that kind of thing, but most of them are kind of that white and black. So let's talk about the handheld magnifiers. And we are going to use trade names because this is a very specialized area and for somebody watching this that may want to look for this so they could go and they could look at it on the internet. Uh, I, I certainly don't have any uh, business interest in any of these. I just, we just want to help people. So let's talk about the Mattingly first. Sure. Um, so there's a couple different companies like you're mentioning. So um, the hand and stand magnifier. So this is an example of a hand magnifier. It's something that would, you would use to spot vision with. So for example, if you needed to read a price or um, something on a soup label, this might be a good option for you. They come in different powers and different sizes. Um, they come, some of them come with a light, some come without a light, some have come with different colors of light. Um, and so even some of these can be found over the counter. The only thing I, I caution you with, and I've seen this many times, is that when we start to have vision problems, sometimes our family members want to help us or we want to help ourselves, and we may start to purchase these types of products over the counter. The caution I have with that is that depending on what your vision level is, if you buy something that is too, uh, too strong per se, and then your vision continues to decrease, there's only a certain limit of magnification that these can provide. So if you're used to having something maybe three times bigger than what you normally need it to be, and then your vision continues to reduce, there may be a point where we can't ever make it three times bigger than what your vision loss is. So um, I kind of tease that you know, if you've been eating Thanksgiving sized dinners for your whole life, and then somebody puts you on Weight Watchers, you don't like it. Same thing with the devices. As soon as you start getting things too big, 
your function goes down research shows this because you can't see as much in there as you normally would be able to so your function goes down your ability to adapt to magnification will be a problem later if your vision continues to decrease um, so for those reasons it's great if you want to evaluate them and and maybe try them on your own but take them to your doctor and make sure it's the right power for you um, because you don't want to get in a situation where you won't be able to get um, help as your vision continues to change. The other advantages of a prescription uh, device versus the over-the-counter ones is kind of like the glasses over-the-counter for reading is the quality of the lenses. Um, these lenses have um, very more clear optics. So if you already have fuzzy vision to begin with, and then you use a fuzzy magnifier, um, that can just uh, add to the problem. Some patients need light, some patients don't, depending on your eye condition, and we can, you know, evaluate that with you as well. The other thing I hear a lot is, I just want to have a big screen magnifier, right? One that you can just put across your screen. And they do make those, but as you know, they make them with what's called a Fresnel lens. And a Fresnel lens is um, basically a prism that bends the light to the ability to make the magnification. But the challenge with that is that the quality of that image is very poor. So sometimes bigger isn't always better. And so we, we have that conversation too. And when you say 2x or 3x, you mean two times the normal size or three times the normal size? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. And Eschenbach also makes one. Yes. Uh, and, yes. Uh, Very similar. They all pretty much look the same. Um, some of them are square, some of them are circular. Um, and this is a hand one. So this would just be something that um, you would spot with. They, uh, both companies also make what we call a stand magnifier. And this is one that would sit flat on the reading material that you were using to read. And this would be more for extended reading. So it would sit flat on the page and then you would just scroll it across, kind of like a typewriter. You would go across the line so that you could read, come all the way back, scoot it down, go all the way across, come back. And those are the kinds of trainings that we do. Some of them, which are really nice, if I'm able to show this to you, is that it has a line in here so that little red line that you see, and um, that will help us with patients that are having problems staying on a straight line or having some visual noise. Um, there's other things that we can do to these where we can block things out using a typoscope, which is basically just um, a blacked out uh, filter with a line of um, like the inside is missing so that you can put it on the reading material. And the only thing you'll see is what's in that window. So all of the other visual noise from the glare of the paper will be minimized and we can put those into these. So all kinds of things, just depending on what kind of functional problems you have. And how about for distance, uh, binoculars or telescopes, and that'll give us four times or six times the amount of magnification. If you could explain a little bit about that and who would that help? Yeah, so anybody that has problems with their vision of what we call 2040 or worse, essentially, could benefit from a telescope or something that magnet things far away. And the most uh, common thing that you're familiar with is a pair of binoculars. Um, so our telescopes kind of fall along that line, but most of the time in low vision, each eye isn't seeing the same way. So we'll find the eye that functions better and use that one to do the rehabilitation. There's a pair here. Um, these are what we call a Galilean telescope, which means they have um, two lenses and then the separation here is air. So they're using the index of refraction of the different um, materials of air and then the lens to create that magnified image. These are approximately maybe twice um, the magnification. So instead of sitting 10 feet away, you may be sitting, it would be as if you were sitting five feet away. And both companies that we mentioned uh, have their products similar to this. You wouldn't be able to walk around with this device, but it might be great if you're sitting watching television and you can't rearrange your furniture to sit closer. Um, it might be nice if you're wanting to, um, you know, bird watch or, or see anything that's farther away. It'll make it as if you're twice as close to that image. And then from there, we have other products, like you said, the telescopes that are stronger. Uh, we normally call those monoculars, meaning that you would just hold it in one hand and put it up to your eye, usually the better seeing eye. And then uh, 
some of those we can put mounted into glasses, which we call either uh, mounted straight ahead, what we call a full field diameter telescope, or one that we would use for bioptics, like for driving. Yeah. So let's talk about virtual reality and augmented reality, and what's the difference, and how could this new game with the gamers use can help our low vision patients? Yes. So the virtual reality and augmented reality, all these mixed reality, all these kinds of things that our devices are doing. So um, kind of like when you have your Snapchat where you can put these filters of images on your, on your pictures and those kinds of things, you can incorporate these into these electronic types of devices. Um, some of them also have the ability to um, create the essentially a computer in your glasses. So if you were looking at a painting and it was a picture of France, you could you know tap on it and it would literally turn you into a um, Google page of what France is and you could learn information and, and things of that nature. Um, a lot of these things are being used in the medical field um, just basically to advance and expedite um, services and, and care um, for people. And then a lot of these devices are um, almost creating these, these virtual spaces of this virtual world where you're kind of immersed into these things, kind of like the video games that, that you experience, yeah. Yeah, it's great that they're able to use that type of technology. So let's talk about augmented reality. Uh, what are some of the devices that are being used and how are they used by the low vision patients to help them? Yes. So there's a couple different devices that are out there. Um, we have some like um, the IRA is a product that's out there. Um, and that's a device that uh, patients can wear and there'll be someone available to them to help them uh, on their path. So if somebody's walking down a street and maybe there's construction and so they're not able to get to the place that they used to to get to, um, their normal path has now been compromised. They can actually reach out to somebody that will be able to see what's going on in that location and give them an alternate route and kind of take them around um, to where they need to go. Um, there's other things that are used from an app standpoint, like for example, um, Be My Eyes. So that is an app that is on your phone at no cost and you can take a picture of what you're looking at or want help with with, and then you will be able to speak to somebody that will see whatever that image is and describe it to you or tell you how to get around whatever obstacle it is. Um, so it's really kind of neat and anybody can do that. So if you want to be somebody just to um, get the experience, you can get on Be My Eyes and be um, the person to help the visually impaired person. And then at the end, uh, the visually impaired person can give you a rating to let them know, yes, you know, this person was very helpful to me or no, maybe this person wasn't as helpful. So um, that the next time if somebody else needs help, you can kind of be higher up on, on the list. And I, I just think it's really neat um, that we have these kind of abilities where we literally have someone available to us that we didn't have before. In the past, when we had these situations, patients would either need to have somebody physically with them or a guide dog or they would need to have the blind cane, the white cane with the red tip. And I'm not saying that these devices replace those by any means, but I'm just saying that now we may have people on the other line uh, that can actually see what we're doing and, and can assist us, which is pretty cool. Yeah, it's great that people would volunteer and help people like that, especially the partially sighted. So if somebody wants to get involved and help these people, they just would contact Yes, absolutely. They can go to those apps, like that app, like I said, Be My Eyes, um, and you can sign up to be a, a visually, um, uh, I guess, a visual helper, basically. So let's talk about the next generation uh, head-mounted devices. Talk about eSight. Okay, so all these head mounted devices, there's eSight, um, there's Geordi, all these different companies um, are 
iris vision. There seems to be more and more coming out, um, but they all basically do the same thing. So these are head mounted devices that are kind of like that virtual reality, meaning that when you put them on, you're immersed into these camera screens and these camera screens can be change your contrast. You can change the colors. You can change the size, making things bigger um, or smaller, what have you. Um, some of them have voice commands, tapping commands, just depending. Um, and the advantage of them is that you're able to see things on these camera screens right in front of you, and it gives you that nice magnified image. I think some of the challenges to these, number one, are their costs. Um, they're very expensive, um, and many patients aren't able to afford these types of devices. Some of them are as low as $2,500 to $3,500. Some of them are high as $15,000, and some of them have come down over the years, but they basically all do the same thing thing. Um, and I always encourage patients, if you've seen something like this and you're interested in learning more, definitely go to the doctor and get the evaluation because you might be 2100 and you definitely don't need a device of that level because there's so many other devices that could help you meet that goal. Um, as long as other things are, you know, contrast is good, that side vision is good, that kind of thing. So again, it's very disease specific per se. But that's kind of how these devices work. So these new eyes or OrCam or Geordi 2, they're more maybe more for people that are, have severe, more severe vision loss? Yes, I would say those that have more severe advanced end stage loss. Um, the OR cam is a little unique in that the OR cam is more, I would say, getting to the point of your vision where devices and magnification systems aren't going to be the best for you, you need to start incorporating other senses like your hearing. So for example, OR cam uh, uses OCR, uh, optical character recognition technology. So if you have that instrument on, it has a camera and you can point to something and it will start to read to you what you're looking at, whether it's a street sign, a book, a menu, um, you can even have it program people's faces. So if you want them to be able to recognize you, uh, I could program it to say, you know, Dr. Carrie Gelb, whenever you came in the room. Um, so again, that kind of device is kind of starting to get into the range of um, where I say you need to start using your, your auditory cues. And there's other devices as well, but this is a headborne device um, and they've got newer technology out. I think there's a newer version of it that just came out recently. Um, and they keep coming up with new technologies with all of these products. So as soon as they've come out with one, about six months later, they've got a new advanced version. Um, the one advantage of the Iris Vision, which is more for the patient that's moderate to severe stage that still uses their vision, that is based off of smartphone technology. So that um, can be updated as you go. So the software from the phone can be um, upgraded um, whenever they have a new, um, you know, software update that comes out. So again, there's pros and cons to all of them. They're, a, they're definitely an investment. And, you know, some patients are like, well, gosh, because these magnifiers here, might be about $200, give or take. Um, this little telescope, very similar, $150, $200. And then those electronic devices are in the thousands of dollars. Um, and I always tell a patient, you know, everything's relative because, you know, sometimes a pair of glasses can be $800 or $1,000, depending on what kind of lens and quality that you want. And you have to think about how much time you're using the devices and how often you're going to use it and how it's going to enhance your life. I mean, hearing aids are, I think $10,000 approximately. So in my opinion, low vision aids do have a price that goes to them, but I think it's the quality uh, that you get and um, the quality of life that you get out of what you purchase. But be very careful because a lot of patients become so desperate to see understandably that they will spend any kind of money just to try to see better. And my caution is, is that you may be buying something that's too much for you, that you may be able to get something more reasonable and um, easier to function with. I noticed now they have a finger reader. You know, you just, you, you put it on your finger and it actually, you point at something and it'll read it for you. Yeah. There's even an app called can 
KNFB Reader. Um, and that one is one that is very highly recommended among my um, very advanced visually impaired patients. And it will read for you. Um, last I checked, I think it's about $100 uh, to purchase it, but it's, it's a great, great product as well. And there's some websites that for support groups uh, that you mentioned, like Blinky Chicks, or are they still around? And yeah, I mean, you can, uh, I think that's what's really great about social media is that I think having a support group is crucial in somebody that has anything going on. Um, you know, when we know that we're not the only ones having a problem, depression gets better. Um, and we start to get that support network because who better to help um, somebody that has a problem than somebody else that has the same problem. I, my patients are my best teachers. I learn a lot of things just because I learned something in school and optically I know, you know, A plus B should equal C. They teach me that it doesn't always work that way. There's a lot of gray and low vision. And so I learn a lot of great things, but yes, um, there's social networks, Facebook. Um, there's some groups out there, um, even local communities we have um, here in our city called the Low Vision Coalition. And that is a group where all of our um, specialists that work with the blind and visually impaired come together once a month. And we talk about the resources and technologies and things that we have for our patients so that we don't duplicate services. So if I have a patient that might need um, accessible technology, so like what we're talking about, maybe evaluating these larger um, cost items like the iris and the OR cam and that kind of thing. Maybe I don't have one of those in my practice. There might be another doctor in the city that does that I can refer over to. And then um, the Lighthouse for the Blind, we have one of those here in our area so we can refer over to them. Um, orientation mobility specialists that help with the blind canes, we can refer over to them, guide dogs. So we all get together um, and it's a really great opportunity for us to not only help our patients, but bring awareness. And every year we have what we call a low vision expo. And that is a big vendor exhibit where all of us get together. And this year we're gonna be doing it virtually um, and patients can come to this. We bring education, awareness, webinars, seminars, basically it'll be webinars this year. And patients can come to these different tables. And if there isn't something that we can help them with, but we know somebody else can, we can immediately make that referral right there at the event. Um, and same thing when we're in our practice. If we see something that somebody needs, we know that there's somebody down the street. Um, in Florida, when I practiced, I didn't have that kind of network uh, of specialists. So I'm very glad that we have that here. But for patients that need services, um, definitely you can Google, um, even on YouTube, there's a couple uh, patients that have vision loss and uh, they have their own podcasts and they have their YouTube channels and, you know, they, they evaluate these products, they see how they work for them. And um, I always encourage you, if you see something that somebody's using that you think might work for you, reach out to your doctors and see if, uh, if it is something that would benefit you. And you talked about some of the smartphone apps. There's a there's one to help people with their money. So they give the right money to people. Yes, there is one, and you might have to remind me of what the name of it I is. Note. I know. I know. Thank you. Yes, because we've talked about this. So that is started by the federal government and it is free for you to use. There's a bunch of different apps. I mean, you Google this stuff and there's just more and more coming out every day, which is wonderful. Um, but this one is started by the government and it's both for um, English and Spanish. And what I liked about this one is it would be able to tell you um, the money, it tells you the orientation, and it also can do what we call a vibrate or a silent mode. So if you have a bunch of Benjamins, you don't want everybody to know how much money you have, it will uh, just do a vibration of how much uh, is there. And I just think that's really powerful. I mean, back when I first started my practice, um, we had to teach people how to fold money. And that is still something that you can do today. But now we've got all this technology. It's like, it's just really great. And it's at no cost. So of all the ones that I've, I have evaluated, I like that one the best. Uh, is there anything else that we didn't cover that you would like to tell people out there to help low vision patients before we end? I would say that if you've had experience with low vision, and you've had a low vision examination and it's benefited you, share it with your doctors, um, your surgeons, your community. Um, 
the kind of a well-kept secret. There's not a lot of us out there. There's only 20, roughly 20 low vision specialists in optometry graduating around the country every year. Um, and so I always tell my students, position open. There are more people that need our help than we can give help to. Um, it definitely makes a difference in people's lives and uh, education awareness, I think is really key. And if you think that something can't be done for you, ask your doctor. And if that doctor can't help you, then maybe ask another doctor because there's so many things that can be done. And Dr. Stephanie, if people want to find out more about you, how can they do that? Absolutely. Um, so you can go to um, Ask Dr. Stephanie. Uh, I am on um, Facebook. I have a group there. I'm also on LinkedIn. And you can also um, shoot me an email at askdrstephanie at gmail.com. And uh, I thank you so much for your time today for having me on here. This has really been a pleasure. I want to thank Dr. Stephanie Schmidecki for joining me today. She's doing God's work. I want to thank you for what you're doing. And until next time, for Dr. this is Dr. Kerry Gelb for Open Your Eyes. Press boy feet. I have no idea how to say that. Press biopia. Presbyopia might be the ability to see Presbyterians. There are people who are afraid of the press. I have no idea what it is, honestly. Presbyopia. A condition in which the eye loses its ability to focus. Making it hard to see objects up close. I've heard the bifocal, but not right, multifocal. Not multi I have never heard of multifocal contact lenses, no. Since I bought Safe For You, my dad makes me clean his boat. It's natural y es un buen producto. Every time I go back to school, my mom always makes sure that I have my Safe For You products. I bring extra and my roommates certainly don't mind. It's a good thing I had Safe For You to clean up after this little guy. When my hands get dry, I like to wash them with Safe For You. And most importantly, the reason why I buy Safe For You is because it's safe for me and you.